Hello everybody, welcome to Boxing Science and this is Q&A session episode 2. And today, myself and Alan Ruddock will be answering your questions around strength training and conditioning training for boxing. Now the topics that we're going to be covering today is how to squat when you're a taller athlete, how to condition a heavyweight boxer, some amateur boxing hit sessions and also how to use a heart rate monitor. So we've received a question on squatting exercises for taller athletes. Now at Boxing Science we're quite used to having taller athletes for their weight categories because they need to have long levers, long limbs to uh, gain an advantage over their opponents. Especially when we're working towards a heavier weights, where we're working with heavy weights, you know, the taller the athlete, the longer lever length they have. And this can make squatting, deadlifting, and kind of pressing exercises more troublesome for taller athletes. So let's talk about squatting. So with their legs being longer, especially their femurs, this will um, impact ankle mobility, which will increase the shear forces going onto the knees. And also with their torso being a lot longer as well, this can make them have a little bit more of a forward lean, especially when they're doing the back squat. So we've got to use different squatting variations to help suit that athlete, to make sure that squatting is done in a safe way, to make sure that we're improving them foundational, fun, uh, sorry, them foundational movement patterns for an effective squat, but also to help reduce them shear forces on the knees and the lower back, and to help optimize that weight load so we can maximize their physical adaptations from the training process. So I'm gonna show you three exercises now to help improve movement, reduce them shear forces, and also optimize weight load. So a great squatting exercise to use with a taller athlete is a landmine squat. This is a fantastic exercise to use to help build fundamental squat patterns. The landmine squat is a fantastic exercise because the trajectory of the bar helps use that hip hinge pattern that is needed in a foundational squat movement. Now, with taller athletes, because they've got longer legs, what they tend to do when they come down, they're quite upright or wanting to lean forward, but particularly the knees are gonna overtrack the toes because they've got poor ankle mobility and they've got long femurs. So the knees are going out over the toes. This makes the squat more quadricep uh, dominant movement and also they've got shear forces going through the knee. So this is where athletes can associate knee pain with uh, doing squats. Whereas the landmine squat, the trajectory of the bar takes you back and helps you use your hips a lot more. So then the knees are in line with the toes, but no over tracking. So we're getting our glutes more involved, but also reducing the shear forces on the knee joint. So I'll show you a quick demonstration. You're gonna grab the bar. You're gonna have the bar in a landmine attachment. We've got ours set up in the squat rack, but you can get an attachment that actually sits into a weight plate, and this can be bought like off Amazon or other websites. You're gonna have a slight lean into the bar to start off with, and the fulcrum of the bar is just sitting into your chest. And then you're gonna have your feet shoulder width apart. You're gonna push your knees to the outside, sit into that deep squat pattern, and then drive up, squeezing glutes at the top, getting that full hip extension. We're pushing the hips back, the knees go out wide. We're sitting onto the heels. We keep our core tense all the way through. Nice, slow, controlled tempo on the way down. An aggressive driving through the heels on the way up. Now, at the start, I explain that we want a slight lean at the top. The reason why, because of the tra trajectory of the bar, it's hard to start in an upright position, come down and get that depth. So I'm here. I'm really sitting back onto the heels, I'm rounding over, I find it really hard to achieve that full squat pattern. So it's important to lean in first, to get that natural groove to sit into that squat, and then drive it up. So the next squatting exercise for taller athletes is a box squat. Now this is an exercise where you can improve strength, but reduce them uh, forces on the lower back and the knee. Because we're taking away that bottom bit where we're having to really control we, it's giving us more support, so it reduces the forces on the lower back and the knee. So in terms of setting up the box height, I'd say this is a, an exercise to help improve uh, functional movement, but also want to improve strength. So you don't want to get one too deep where you're reducing 
uh, the load that's on the bar, but also you don't want something too high where we're not getting that full range of motion. So I'd say to get a box where you set up, where it's just around about uh, above 90 degrees. So this is about where you'd be squatting to for most boxers. If you want to go, if your box is struggling and you've seen a bit of a drop off in terms of what they can squat, try and go a little bit higher, maybe like an 80 or 70 degree angle. So I'll show you a quick demonstration on how to perform the box squat. You're going to grab the bar, pop it onto the top of your shoulders and step back. When your feet shoulder width apart, be not wanting your feet too close to the box because you want it to be, again, you want to be using your hips and not going too far forward with your knees. So it's a little bit in front of the box, sitting back, pushing knees out wide, and then driving up. A slight touch on the box. What I don't want to see is you relaxing, being in an upright position, and almost like you can lift up your feet off the floor. You want to make sure that you're still pushing against the floor, creating that energy, and then driving up. A progression from this is to do a quick touch and go, but I'd say just generally start off your athlete, a little touch, and drive up. Like I said, you want to make sure that you're making it as much like a squat pattern without the box as possible. So this next squatting variation for taller athletes is the Anderson squat. This can really unlock an athlete's strength, their maximal strength, because we're working from a partial range, so we can really overload that squat pattern. Like I said before, it can be quite hard for a taller athlete to achieve them weight loads to optimize physiological adaptations, and this exercise can certainly do that. It's a very good exercise that we use with a lot of boxers to help improve their strength, speed, and explosiveness. So I'm gonna demonstrate the Anderson squat. So you want to get into a partial range squat. So I'd like to use a quarter squat because this is where you can really overload the movement. We're gonna sit in, we're gonna make sure that we're pushing our hips back and our knees pushed down. We can be quite guilty of being, trying to be too upright in the Anderson squat position. So use them hips, fire up them legs, and then you really potentiate your hips to drive forward into a powerful hip extension. You need to make sure that you're taking a deep breath in before you go to create that core tension and then drive it up nice and forceful. I'd say for athletes to go between three and five repetitions and to target around about 110 to 120% of their one rep max. To start off with though, go for your one rep max, try and perform that three to five times and then start building it up week by week to really unlock that maximum strength. So the next question is around conditioning methods for heavyweight boxers. Now this is a topic that we've covered quite a lot of boxing science because heavyweight boxers are a different breed of athlete. You know, they're tall, they can go from six foot all the way through to six foot nine. They can range from 16 all the way up to 19 stone. So this has a different impact on the different kinds of conditioning methods that they need in terms of suit their sport, their kind of punch outputs, they're producing a lot of force in them punches as well. So they need a different conditioning stimulus from a physiological standpoint. Now I'm gonna talk about the biomechanical standpoint of that them being tall and, and quite heavy. When they're running, we don't want to expose them to too high impact forces or training volumes as well because they can end up picking up overuse injuries, especially around the joints, the ankle, the knee joint, and also the lower back. So we alter the different uh, kind of work to rest ratios on the curve and on the treadmill. This is what Alan will talk about in a short while, but also we limit the amount of times that they actually run. So we normally do one or two running sessions maximum per week with a heavyweight boxer. Then we'd look to use alternative conditioning tools. So something off feet where they don't have them high impact forces, but we can stress them and put them into uncomfortable situations to target them for physiological responses. So typical exercises that we use, uh, sorry, particular methods that we use, uh, the air bike, the watt bike, and also we do some circuits as well. These circuits 
uh, have an upper body stimulus as well because they're carrying a lot of upper body muscle mass. Uh, so this has a contribution to their conditioning levels. So we need to make sure that they have a certain level of upper body conditioning over like kind of lighter boxes. So this circuit here is a fantastic uh, conditioning tool for heavyweight boxers to improve their upper body conditioning. Okay, just like we make considerations with strength training for heavyweights, we've got to make some considerations in their conditioning. Now, heavyweights throw a lot of high force punches and they're very, very muscular. So what we need to do is work on their peripheral side of their fitness. And what that means is we're really trying to target adaptations at the muscle level so they can continue to throw high force punches, but also deal with their demands of their opponent when they're holding and clinching and producing those high consistent, high force, high demand activities. So we would undertake periods, training periods of muscle buffer training to deal with that level of acidosis that is you know, concomitant with those high forces. And we'd also undertake periods of sprint interval training, again, encouraging those high forces, large high levels of, of lactate and acidosis to induce those peripheral adaptations so they can produce high forces repeatedly throughout the bout. So this is one of the most common questions that we get is how to use a heart rate monitor. Now we found one of the easiest and affordable ways to track heart rate during exercise and during training is to use a Bluetooth heart rate monitor and connect that Bluetooth heart rate monitor to your phone. So we use a Wahoo Bluetooth heart rate monitor. So this is a standard Wahoo, probably costs around 40 pounds, something like that. You can get versions um, that are upgraded to this that do a little bit extra for about 60, 65 pounds, that's a ticker X. We also recommend the Polar H10 or the Polar OH1 as well. Now, the best app we found to monitor heart rate is Polar Beat. Um, Wahoo do their own app, but we've, we found it's very easy to use both on iOS and Android. You can see your heart rate in real time. You can set your, your training zones on there. And so you can look at the key metrics, such as how much time you're spending in the red zone. So these are really easy um, to, to put on your athlete. The most important thing is that you place it around mid sternum and then have your athlete swivel around. And then if you just hold that in place there, pull that around and then it just clips in. There's just two little clips that, that fasten together. And the Wahoo belt's really nice because they will flash blue when they're transmitting um, and red. So you can see, and you probably can't pick this up on the cameras, but they are flashing now, showing that they are connected. And then it's just a case then of connecting that to the heart rate monitor. And we'll demonstrate that during the session. Another really easy thing to do on Polar Beat is to set up the heart rate monitor so it's transmitting via Bluetooth. To do that, you go to settings, heart rate sensor, and if you have Bluetooth enabled, then it will search for the heart rate monitor that's in the closest location. We have two um, found sensors at the moment. We've got loads lying around the, the gym. Um, so we're gonna choose the one that Danny's wearing and just click pair. That will pair. And once we've done that, we can then set our athlete settings. So on here, uh, we can go to, why do we need to go to here? Profile settings. And we can set up the date of birth, height, weight, body mass in there, and set, crucially, heart rate max. One of the most convenient things about Polar Beat for us is that zone five which is what we call the red zone, is actually set up at 90% heart rate max. So it's really, really easy when you set your maximum heart rate to see when you're hitting the red zone. So Danny's heart rate max here is 190. 
and it means when we come to visualize the session we can see how much time he's spending in the red zone and when he's in the red zone and that's just a case of toggling back going to training and what you should find now is you can see resting heart rate Danny stood up at the moment we've actually just done a session so his heart rate is a little bit elevated for resting and what you might find is it's probably around 70 to 80 beats per minute something like that if you're, you're just about to start your session and you've just done a little bit of a warm-up as we can see Danny's is about 100 at the moment and then you can select the different profile um, so normally we're indoor treadmill running so that's the setting that we're going to select and then click start and then we can begin the session what we can see what's really really useful for us is a heart rate trace with our heart rate zones um, neatly presented on the app so that we can see when Danny is in the different zones whether he's in the blue zone or the green zone or the red zone and we can adjust the intensity that he's running at dependent upon his heart rate response we can also see the accumulated time in each different zone as well. So when we know that we've got targets to hit, certain time targets in the red zone, we might need to tailor the session, cut the session, you know, or do something a little bit differently just to make sure that we're optimizing the session based upon his heart rate responses. And that's it. And let the session run, monitor the heart rate and make adjustments accordingly. So what we can see now is Danny's heart rate is increasing fairly rapidly because we've just done a session. I mean, he's only been doing a minute's worth of running. Speed's probably about 20 kilometers an hour, something like that. And you can see he's just about creeping up to it. He's inside his red zone there and he's hit 171 beats per minute. And you know, we can use that as a gauge, an intensity gauge and we can look at you know, how much time he's spending in the red zone and how we need to manipulate the speed and the duration to ensure that that is optimal for the particular session that we're doing. A great session for amateur boxers, especially leading into big tournaments, is three by three minutes with one minute recovery. But those three minutes isn't just one continuous bout of running, it's separated into 15 second clusters. So six times, 15 on, 15 off. Now that enables boxers to reach high speeds and high intensities during that 15 second interval, but have a short period of recovery in between, you know, and that replicate, replicates um, the intensities that amateur boxers will encounter in tough competition. But physiologically, it enables athletes to get close to and attain VO2 max and that will encourage central adaptations in the cardiovascular system. And not only is it specific to amateur boxing and its activity profile, but it will also get you those specific fitness gains as well. Good. So that first rep, average speed, this is average speed here, 26 kilometers an hour. So we're looking for Danny to <clears throat> maintain 26 kilometers per hour, certainly for the next couple of reps. We're looking to see Good, so that was 25.5 average, so there or thereabouts. And we've got to remember is that he's already done a session as well, but I'll be looking just to spend a few couple of reps at that first speed. And we can see he's already in the red zone, which is exactly what we would want to see in amateur boxing. That was 24. So he's in the red zone already. <clears throat> Amateur boxers will typically hit the red zone after a minute during sparring. And again, this is replicating those intensity profiles of sparring.
Yes, good work, mate. That's good. Well done. So he's maintaining around 24 kilometers per hour now. There's two more reps. Done. So just getting a drop off now. So he's able to hit high speeds in the first five, 10 seconds ago, and then he's just dropping off a little bit. What we can see is well into the red zone there, 93% heart rate max. Well done, mate. Well done. And then finished off with 22 kilometers per hour. So we can see his heart rate profile here. Hits it the red zone after around about a minute. And then you can quite clearly see the, the on and off parts of the session replicating that intermittent demand of amateur boxing. Okay, so that brings us to the end of episode two. I hope you've enjoyed it and got a great insight to some of the methods that we use down here at Boxing Science. If you're wanting any of your questions answered in the next episode, please look out for our stories, our Instagram stories, where we're giving you the opportunity to ask a question or comment in the comment box below. If you're not subscribed yet, hit the subscribe button and I hope to see you on the next video.